Yes, and where is the Advent movement found in the Bible? What chapter in the book of Revelation? The Advent movement, the foundation where your where you're, you're people born out of prophecy. Reve Revelation chapter what? Chapter 10. And chapter 10 is connected to Revelation chapter 14, and it's also connected to Matthew chapter 25, all right? So you're going to find, again, under inspiration that we said here earlier, remember, and um, I want you to just keep that in mind. But before we get started, we're going to claim a promise found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. The Bible says, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit search of all things, yea, the deep things of God. How many things does the Holy Spirit search everybody? All things, yea, the deep things of God. This word, deep things, from the Greek translation is the word bathos. And it means to go beneath the surface. And we're going to see again that the method is to go beneath the surface using line upon line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little, all right? So we're going to look at that a little closer as we go through the Word of God tonight, all right? With that thought in mind, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath that's drawing nigh. We ask thee that in this evening, that as we enter into rest with thee, that you will give us peace. For you said, my peace I give unto you. My peace I leave unto you. Not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Father, we see fearful sights in Hawaii. We see fearful sights even sometimes in our own communities. We're told that men's hearts will fail them for fear and for looking after those things coming upon the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. But Lord, you told us in these times we live in to fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Uphold us tonight, Lord, and keep us in your care, and grant us the instruction from the Holy Spirit tonight. Grant that the Spirit of the living God that is supposed to dwell with us and in us will be our divine teacher as we study your word. For it is not just my words alone. Only the Holy Spirit can bring the truth home to the heart. So, Lord, please give us understanding of the scriptures and help us rightly divide the word of truth. We address our prayer to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, where Jesus is our great high priest, and where the hour of judgment is in session, and where soon and very soon our names will come up in review. O oh Lord, please grant that we will find ourselves clothed in the righteousness of Christ, when our name shall we come up before thy throne in the universe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now turn me in your Bibles, if you will, uh, to Matthew chapter 25. Now we want to review some things with you. Remember, we found out, I asked you earlier, what was present truth? You hear people say present truth. You got ministries that call themselves present truth. Present truth is simply the three angels' messages first, second, and third angel's messages that was given to God's people since 1844. Are you with me now? That's very plain. Now, in the, the book Early Writings, page 63, it says, there are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. Now, that's what the Spirit of Prophecy says, but what does the Bible say about present truth? In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, the Bible says this, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in present truth. Established what? In present truth. That means truth for this time. All right? Now, does that mean you negate the other truths of the Bible? No, but the Bible says, but we're told on inspiration, that we also need what? Present truth for now. Why? Because we're watching the events taking place in our world. We're seeing the different unsettled state of society. We're watching people stand in a state of confusion. We see men's hearts filling for fear. We've heard about familiar side where fam whole families uh, committed suicide, especially when the stock market fell in 2008. 
You remember that? And different things and the, and, and, and the different financial crises we've been in since 2008. And so we're going to find as we look at these things that our only constellation is in Jesus. Jesus is the refuge that you've got to have. Without Jesus, you don't have a refuge. Without Jesus, you don't have a life in reality. Because he's made it very clear. Without Jesus, you cannot stop sin. Without Jesus, you cannot overcome. Without Jesus, you cannot break habits. And so it's important that you keep a relationship, a personal close communion with Jesus. Now, going on, it says in Great Controversy, page 393, listen carefully. The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of the Advent people. What is it, everybody? The parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25 also illustrates the experience of God's what? People. Now, in Review and Herald, August 1890, it says this. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. The parable, this parable, has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. For it has a special application for this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continually be present truth to the close of time. The parable of the ten virgins is connected with the third angel's message. Now, if she says that, I want to find it from the Bible. Don't you? Okay, that's what we're going to find out tonight. The first part of the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25, 1, is the experience of the Advent people. Now, you say, what this got to do with religious liberty? It's got everything to do with religious liberty because you're dealing with your, me your, your message, and it's your message that's going to cause you to lose your religious liberty. Believe it or not. Because of what the message entails dealing with salvation and the warning that God has given about the worship of false worship systems of the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name. Now, it is not just the mark of the beast that's the third angel's message. It is also the message of Christ our righteousness, which is also the third angel's message. In fact, righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. You can talk about the Pope until you're blue in the face. You can talk about the mark of the beast and everything that's about to happen. But if you don't have the power of Christ's righteousness, you will not be able to stand against the onslaught of what is about to come upon us and the world as an overwhelming surprise when we find out how this system will be set up. And you have to understand that your faith has to be fixed in Jesus. Because you're going to find that faith cometh by what? Hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And if you have not been studying the Word of God, when you come up to the crisis time, you won't, have, you won't be able to exercise the faith that is needed to stand against the pressure that you'll be under. And many will buckle and finally give up the faith just because of the pressure they're going to be under. Now, I'm just going to make it plain for you so you can get the point with me, all right? Now, follow me now as we go back to Matthew 25. We're closer. We said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the who? The bridegroom. For quick review, who are the virgins? Ten is a universal number. Virgins represent what? God's what? God's people, his church. Is that right? But that church was called what? Christianity. When was God's people first called? When were the disciples first called Christians? Go with me to Acts chapter 11. Verse 20, 26, so you make sure you understand. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. In Acts 11, looking here at verse 26, the Bible says here, And when they found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So when you talk about the church, you're dealing with Christianity. Are you with me now? All right, we're dealing with who? Christianity. Now, let's be, some, let's, let's be clear about that. Now, at the same time, we find that here that Christianity has what is given. What is Christianity? What, is the Christian, what, is, what has Christianity been given? What has Jesus given the disciples in Christianity? The gospel. Is that right? 
So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're dealing with the gospel of the kingdom. Isn't that right? Remember Romans 1, 16 and 17? Paul said it this way. I'm just reviewing with you because I gave, I gave you mostly sex of a night. It says here, what does Paul say for, in Romans 1, 16 and 17? He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the what? Righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, for as is written, the just shall live by what? Faith. So the just or the righteous shall live by what? Faith. And so we find it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what gospel is this? This is the everlasting gospel. It was a gospel that was founded from the foundation of the world. Isn't that right? It contains the plan of what? Salvation, not only to save man from sin, but to restore man back into the image of his maker. What is true education? If you were to go to the book Education, you would find true education is the, true education is the restoration of the image of God in man mentally, physically, and spiritually. That is exactly what redemption is, the restoration of the image of God in man. And so we're going to see that that's what this plan of salvation is going to bring in. But let's go a little bit closer as we look at this. We're going to see something else here. So the kingdom of heaven is the gospel of the kingdom, the everlasting gospel. What, what gospel is this? Go to Revelation 14, 6. I'm just reviewing with you briefly as we go through it. You have most of these texts already. Revelation 14, 6 says what? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, what? Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Here is the everlasting gospel and the first angel's message. And we're going to find in the parable that of the Millerite history, we're going to find that the Millerites were preaching the first and second angel's messages. And we found that on Wednesday night, and now we're going to look at the third angel's message. Where is the third angel's message in the parable of the ten virgins, which the, which the spirit of prophecy says is actually the experience of the Advent movement or the Advent people? How is that? I don't see it on the surface. It's not on the surface, but when you compare Scripture with Scripture, you begin to see clearly that the parable is there when you understand the principles of the symbols of biblical interpretation from the parables that we're dealing with. Look carefully with me. In, in, in Great Controversy, listen carefully. In many of his parables, Christ used the expression kingdom of heaven to designate the divine grace, uh, it, says, upon, it says, upon the heart. A work, okay, now designate what? The work of divine grace upon the heart. That's what kingdom of heaven dealt with. But what is grace? You know, we talk about that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, as any man should boast. Now, grace not only means divine favor, but grace is also the divine influence in the heart and its reflection in the life. What divine influence can affect your mind and transform your character and it can be seen in your life. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So grace is not only, in some areas, grace is favor. But in some other areas of the scriptures, grace is the divine influence of the Holy Spirit working his will in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. Based on Philippians 2.13. Now, let's go a little bit closer as we look at this issue. Matthew 25 said there were 10 virgins. What is 10? We said 10 was a what? universal number. Isn't that right? Now let's go a little bit closer. Ten in the Greek means a whole or complete. It signifies perfect or divine or complete. It implies nothing is wanting. All right? So who do the virgins symbolize in the parable? God's church. Is that clear now? All right? Now, in Christ's Object Lessons, page 412 now, since we said that, I'm going to give you the spirit of prophecy on that to, cap, to close that, cap down, that section down. It says, the chaste virgins represent Christianity. This is Christ's Object Lessons, page 412. It says, the chaste virgins represent Christianity. But in the midst of Christianity, God has his people of the great Advent movement. The ten virgins are watching, the, watching in the evening of this, of this earth's history. All claim to be Christians. Is that clear to everybody? All right, let's go to our next point now. What do lamps symbolize? The ten virgins took their lamps. What do we find about the lamps? 
Lamps, huh? In Psalms 119, 105, that word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So lamps refer to the word of God. Isn't that right? What other names are used for the word of God? If we would go to the Bible in Daniel 17, and go to John 17, 17. What other name is given to the word of God besides the word of God? Let's take a look. In John 17, 17, the Bible says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is what? Truth. Okay? In Daniel 10, 21. Let's look at Daniel 10, 21. Another name for the word of God. I didn't give you this the other night, so I give you this too right here. It says here, But I will show you, I will show thee that which is noted in what? The scripture of what, everybody? Truth. It says, And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. Now notice another name for the word of God is called the word of truth or the what? Scripture of what? Truth. Is that right? So now we're going to find here the word of truth or the scripture of truth is also a lamp. Is that right? In Proverbs 6.23, we talked about that the other night. Proverbs 6.23, it says what? In Proverbs 6.23, the Bible says the what? The commandment is a lamp, the law is a light, and re reproof and instruction are the way of what? Life. Everybody see that? So we're going to see that again. But let's go a little closer. Now, the commandment here, it says the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. The commandment here is, not, is dealing with here the first five books of the Old Testament. All right? It's dealing with the Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament, Exodus, I mean Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the law refers to here is also, this, uh, these books are also called the Torah or to guide or to teach. So the lamps are the word of God, the scripture of truth, which also magnifies the Decalogue because the law here is referring to the Decalogue, okay? So I want you to understand that. What does the law refer to everybody? Okay, so the commandment is a lamp and the law is a what? Is a light. So we're going to see that as well. But going on, it says here, by lamps, it refers to the Word of God. But let's go a little closer on this one for a moment. Lamps give, what do lamps give? Light. No, that's not you. That's somebody, somebody trying to call me. I forgot to turn my phone off. And I just want to be sure about this. I don't know what's going on, but I'm not going to answer that right now. So I'm going to, put, I'm going to cut this off. Sorry about that. I should have told everybody, cut your phones off. Now you saw my cut off, all right? All right. Let's go over here for a minute. But now let's go for a moment. Do, what do lamps give? Are you sure? Lamps give light. But let's see something. First of all, let's see something for a moment. Lamps give light. Where did we find, who, was, who did we find out was light? Jesus was light. We reviewed that other day. But now let me give you something else. Did you know that your mind is also a lamp, but a word lamp also means a candle. When you read the Old Testament history and the, and, and the Hebrew use of the word lamp, it meant thy word is a candle to my feet and a light unto my path. Now, let's go, but let's take it up, let's bring it up a notch. We're going to find out something. Because God wants you to understand the scriptures. But in order for God to teach you the scriptures, there's something about you that must, you must understand. Did you know that the word is not the only candle? Did you know there's something else that's a candle? To me to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. 20, I'm sorry, Proverbs 20, 27. Proverbs 20, 27. The Bible says, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The what? The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now this word spirit means the mind of man. The Bible says, your mind is God's candle. Did you hear it? Did you, did you, did you get it or did you miss it? Your mind is God's candle. As long as your mind has not been lit, you're in darkness. But when God begins to start to light your candle, you start seeing light. Now, what do we find out light does? Now, Jesus is light. His word is light. But what else did the Bible say about his word? Now, let's see something for a moment. Go with me for a Bible. Go with me for a moment. Um, go, with, go with me for a moment. I want to know what else the Bible said about God's word. And sometimes, let me be sure if I got the right one. I want to make sure I give you this one right here. I think I got the right text I want to give you on this one. About God's word for a moment. 
uh, because there's something there that's very important to me. Um, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah about his word. If somebody can find it, it will be good, right? It says, is not my word like, a, like, like fire that breaks, or, or like my, no, it's not my word like a hammer that breaks rocks in, pre, in pieces. God's word can be like a what? Hammer that breaks rocks in pieces. But here, the Bible says your mind is God's what? Candle. Now, is the Bible likened to fire? Is the Bible likened to fire? Because in order for you to light a candle, you need what? You need fire. I want to know, is the Bible likened to fire? Come on, talk to me. Yeah, yeah. Is the Bible likened to fire? Huh? Some of you, some of you, huh? Okay, let's see something. I want to just see something for a moment. I want you to go with me to the book here for a moment. Um, I believe it's in Psalms or Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, thy, he, says I, he, he said he, there was like fire in his, his word, God's word was shut up. Watch it. All right. Go with me to Jeremiah 20, verse 9. No, okay. And um, Jeremiah 5, 14 and 20, verse 9. Let's go there. Jeremiah 5, 14. Let's go there. I want to show you something about God's word. Jeremiah 5, 14, as we look at this issue of the parable. Jeremiah 5, 14, the Bible says, Wherefore, thus said the Lord, God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. Wait a minute. Because you speak this word, I will make my words in thy mouth like what? Fire. Watch this carefully now. And this people would, and it shall devour them. God says he likens his word to be like what? fire. Now remember, your mind is God's what? Candle. Keep that in mind. Now go me to Jeremiah. Uh, I gave you one more. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. In Jeremiah 20, verse 9, the Bible says here, Then said I, I will not make mention nor speak any more in his name. Now, Jeremiah was a preacher that went into protest. He kind of resented the way things were, hap things were happening to him, being put in prison, being put in a pit, and all kind of things, king treating him all rough and everything, all because he's having to speak what God says. So he said, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Lord, I'm not going to mention your name. Can you imagine that? You know how some of you might feel on your job, you, some jobs prohibit you to talk about Jesus. And then other jobs, you're not prohibited, but you're just not going to say nothing anyway because you, you don't want to draw any attention. Listen carefully. Then said I, I will, make, I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire. Shut up. It says, in my bones. And I was weary and with forbearing, and I could not stay. So even when you make up your mind that you're not going to say nothing about Jesus, you're not going to talk about God in this word, you're not going to talk about prophecy, if God is really put in your heart and you have been his spokesman, the time will come that no matter how much you try to forbear, your mind will become weary. You will never get rest until you preach or teach the word of God like he told you to. That's what the Bible says. So we got the word, but your mind, you said, well, Pastor, why are you talking about the mind like fire? Remember, your mind is a what? A candle. But a candle has to be lit. Isn't that right? So what will God use to light your candle? First of all, go with me in your Bibles to, Mac, to uh, John chapter 3. John, I mean, Matthew chapter 3. Go with me in Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3. I want you to see it with me now. You there? In Matthew chapter 3, I want you to look here for a moment to see what God's going to use to light your candle very soon. Watch this. You ready? So if you're sitting in the church dormant, if you're sitting at home and you've been weary and you're tired of this present world and you're tired of this life and you're trying to make changes, you need to spend some time with God and you need to say, Lord, I need you to light my candle. I need you to light my mind, to light my will. 
Are you with me now? Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh, to me, cometh after me is mightier than I, I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. This is John the Baptist speaking. He shall baptize you with what, everybody? With the Holy Ghost and with what? Fire. Fire. So what is the Holy Ghost likened unto? Fire. The word fire in the actual when you break it down, if, if fire means burning, but in the, in, the, in the symbolic sense, fire refers to a joy and enthusiasm. It shows that you are on fire for God. You have this joy and cheerfulness that nothing can take away, and you have this zeal according to knowledge that wants to do the will of God. And you want to study the Word of God. We on fire, you don't put the Word of God down. We on fire, you want to read the Bible all day long sometimes. We on fire, you want to memorize the scriptures. We on fire, you want to learn the scriptures. We on fire, you ready to defend your faith. We on fire, you want to witness to people. We on fire, you want to do charitable things to help people. We on fire, you'll go to the nursing homes. We on fire, you'll go to the community. You nobody have to drag you. Nobody have to set up an appointment. You will make ways to go and do the will of God because you're on fire and you cannot keep the fire locked up in your bones. I hope you're on fire. I hope you get on fire before it's all said and done. Because the end of the world is coming. And they need to see one thing about God's people. They're not just there. Before the world burns, they need to see God's people on fire who set up this world for the final burning. Are you with me now? Oh, it don't come to you yet. It come later. But you'll see. Look what the Bible goes on and says here. So we're going to find that fire is the Holy Ghost. So let me ask you a question. The Bible said the mind of man is the candle of the Lord in Proverbs 20, 27. So in order for your mind to be lit, God has to light your candle. What is God promised to give you so you can light your mind? Because John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me shall baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So God has to give you something. You have to ask God for something that you can have your mind lit. Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, if ye then be in evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that what everybody? Ask him. So God says he'll give you the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost is also what? Fire. And what would the Holy Ghost do in Psalms 119, 130? What would the Holy Ghost do? In John 14, look at watch this now. In John 14, 6, and, John, and so, keep John 14, 6 as well. But go to Psalms 119, 130. The Bible says, the entrance of thy words giveth what, everybody? Light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Wait a minute. The entrance of God's words give what? Light. Light is also connected to what? Fire. The Holy Ghost is going to open up the Word of God. But what is the Holy Ghost going to do when you get the fire in your mind? The Holy Ghost says in John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost will become a teacher. He will begin to show you the Scriptures, and he'll give you the understanding of the Word of God. And look what David said about the fire. The fire is going to get so hot, David said it got so bad that I saw light. Do you understand that? Whatever you were dark for, whatever was dark to your understanding, whatever you didn't understand before, when you get this fire in you, listen to what the Bible says in, in Psalms 18, 28. Psalms 18, 28. Are you there? Uh, turn there so you can get there, but you got to get there. Psalms 18, 28. Are you there? You should be there by now. Psalms, what everybody? 18, 28. Look what the Word of God says in Psalms 18, 28. In Psalms chapter 18, verse 28, the Word of God put it this way. It says, For thou, Lord, it says, For thou will light my candle. What's a candle, everybody? Your mind. Thou, Lord, will light my candle. Look what it says here. And it says, And the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. So wait a minute. What will God's candle do? What will God's word do? The entrance of thy words giveth light. Light begins to shine in your mind. Understanding becomes clear. Those dark areas of the scriptures you didn't understand before now become plain. Daniel becomes plain. Revelation becomes plain. Living a Christian life becomes plain. Putting away things that you know is not right becomes plain. Plain. Old lifestyles become plain. Living relationships become sour because you realize now that you got to live a life for Jesus. I want to ask you a game. 
Is your candle lit? Is your mind lit yet? Has God lit you this morning? Did you spend some time communing, musing while God's Holy Ghost was lightening your candle? Hmm. That's what the Bible says here. And so we find out that light is represented by Jesus. What do we, we find out about Jesus? In John, 1 John 1, 5, about light, 1 John 1, 5, this is the message. We have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's why David said, the Lord thy God have light enlightened my what? Darkness. No darkness when you're following Jesus. You start going in the darkness when you start going in disobedience. But as long as you're walking with God like you should, you won't go in the darkness. Jesus said, walk while you have the light. Let's a greater thing come upon you. Isn't that right? He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Oh, you don't believe me, do you? I'm talking about the ten versions, but I'm, 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 bring, I'm building a point so you can get the point. God gave this church light. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Stop. What did God say? Let there be light. Why? In the context, it said the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Is that what the Bible says? What was on the face of the deep, everybody? Darkness. And God said, what? Let there be light. Why did God say, let there be light? In the midst of an empty earth that was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Why did God say, let there be light? What did he mean when he said, let there be light? When you go back and read the, read the generation very carefully and you put it together, you begin to understand something. Light is connected to something. Here's an empty planet. God's about to make a new creation. He's about to bring a form, a new order of being, never made before. A being that's capable of reflecting his mind. A being capable of reflecting his glory. A being capable of walking with him, talking with him, and being more closer to him than even the angels in heaven. A being of a new order of people. A never made before. Worlds unfallen. Now watch God create a beautiful planet called Earth. Beautiful blue spear, green grass and green trees and everything, surface smooth, a beautiful planet, flowers, life. What's going on? God said, let there be light. But what is light? In John, 1 John, look, go me to John chapter 1. Come on. John chapter 1. We read something very important because we find out the God that created these things. This is talking about, well, by the way, happy Sabbath, everybody. Happy Sabbath, everybody. This ought to be the happiest day of your life every week, every day. This, every week, this is your holiday. It's your holy day. It's the real holy day. The whole world ought to be keeping this day. Are you keeping me now? This is the day that God has blessed. This is the day that we can praise and thank God for his mercies and his kindness and his loving and his goodness to us, his protection through the week. This is the day that we ought to be rejoicing and be exceedingly glad, for this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Boy, y'all waiting until 11 o'clock hour. We got to start on Friday night. Do you understand what time it is? Y'all don't understand what time. Come on, if y'all knew what time it is, you would all be, yeah, you, 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 you couldn't sit still. Look what the Bible says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He was in the world. And watch this very carefully. He was in, he, it says here, I want to make sure I got this right. I want to, it says here, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him, without him, was not anything made that was made. Now watch this very carefully now. In him. Now, what does this say? Who made the world? The word. This word here is a word, it's a Hebrew. In the Greek, it's called logos. But in the Hebrew, when the, you know, the, the Greeks had one way of looking at it. Logos refines it to word. But actually, John is actually saying this Greek, this is the Shekinah glory that sat between the two cherubims. That when Moses would talk with God, he told Moses, I'll meet you between the two cherubims. The two cherubims are found in the most holy place. This is the presence of God. This is the word made flesh to dwell among us. 
And are you understanding this? And this word that was made flesh that dwelt among us, which is called the Shekinah glory, if I had to read it again, it would read like this. In the beginning was the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory was with God, and the Shekinah glory was God. The same Shekinah glory made all things. The same Shekinah glory had life. And the life was the light of men. Do you understand this? Wait a minute now. Light is what? In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be life. Lord have mercy, it hadn't hit you yet. You're thinking about, you're just thinking about some regular light. This is not, listen to me. This light is not the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars. The light is the light of God's presence. In fact, when God would create the world and make Adam and Eve, the spirit of prophecy said they wore no artificial garments. They wore garments of light. But where did that come from? Where did she get that idea from? Maybe she made it up. Oh, she was in vision. That's a unique thought. Really. Go with me to Psalms 103 with me. Come on. Go to Psalms 103. I want to know because if God made man in his image, then God gave man some clothing that he wore. Y'all, it'll come to you later. It hadn't hit you yet, but it'll be all right. Come on. Come on. Are you with me now? Psalms 103. Are you there? In fact, go with me to Psalms 104. Psalms 104 too. Listen very carefully. I know if God made man in his own image, can you please tell me what type of clothes did God wear? This is what the Bible says here. Who covereth thyself with light? What, everybody? Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment? Did you see that here? It says here, who, search, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. What did God wear as a garment? Light. What did Adam and Eve wear in the beginning? Light. And as long as they walked in obedience with God, they wore light like you wear a garment. And when they disobeyed, they were naked because the light of God's mercy, the light of God's love, the light of, God, light of God's clothing disappeared because they disobeyed the will and mind of their creator. They were not reflecting his creator when they ate something that he told them not to eat. Long before you actually go on the transgression, the first thing you must do is decide that you are going to disobey God in mind. And so we find that this is what happened to them. And so when we go to Genesis and God said, let there be light, he's talking about let there be life. Light is life. And everything that's going to be made is made to last forever. God did not intend that man should disobey, that man would disobey and die. But God intended that we would live forever and walk in the light. When Adam and Eve, when God came to see Adam and Eve, what did they do? The Bible said, and Adam, it says, he says, and Adam says, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And the Lord, God, the Lord said to Adam, who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee, thou shalt eat, eat, shall not eat thereof? And he said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Now he blamed it on the woman, and then the woman blamed it on the serpent, and, the, and ultimately they were blaming it on God. If you hadn't have made the woman, I wouldn't have failed. If you hadn't have made the serpent, I wouldn't have failed. They didn't want to own up to their own transgression. You know, like some of us, Lord, if I hadn't been married this man, I'd be a Christian. That woman, she just drives me. I, can't, I just can't make it. What's going on? You want to blame the wife. You want to blame you. But you don't want to look at your own self. You don't want to see that maybe it's you. Maybe you need to change. You're praying that your husband change. You're praying your wife will change. Maybe you need to change. Maybe you need to look, look in the mirror and say, they're not the problem. You're the problem. And ask God to humble your heart and change your ways. And maybe through your godly behavior as a husband, your godly behavior as a wife, your kindness and your fruits of the Spirit, maybe then your wife or your husband might get converted. Or maybe your children's hearts may even turn to you. Maybe you need to change. All right? Go me back to Matthew 25 now. We know that the wise and fool, the wise virgins fear God. Isn't that right? And we find out that the foolish virgins also what? The foolish virgins, the wise virgins know God. The foolish virgins do not know God, right? 
Now, the question was, now, we found out something about that foolish virgins of the day. We found out the foolish virgins are workers of what? Iniquity. Y'all remember that? So remember, because what, what did we find out? Babylon is what? Falling is falling, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of wrath for fornication. Now, in order for the virgins to take the lambs, we found out that we found out something else. We found out that light was not only the word of God, but light was also Bible prophecy. Go with me in your Bibles to 2 Peter 1.19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Now, you got most of the notes from that other night. If you didn't get them, get them from somebody who took, no, took notes, and you, can keep, and you can go back and look at all that later. 2 Peter 1, 19 says, For we also have a more sure word of prophecy, that we do well to take heed as a light, as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise where? In our hearts. We have a more sure word of what? Prophecy. The word sure means certain word. It means without, without doubt. We have a certainty. It's truth, but it's also will fulfill. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And Psalms 119, the Bible puts it this way, Thy word, uh, thy word is true from the beginning. Psalms 119, 160. And so we're going to find, as we go through the word of God, we're going to see some things. But now let's remember, who was these foolish virgins? The Bible says something, watch this very carefully. The Psalms 5.5, 5, so you can remember this, remember this point because of where we're going with the third angel's message. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. It says here, this says here, thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Who are the foolish? Workers of iniquity. Okay, who did Jesus call the workers of iniquity? Go with me to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. Remember this? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many will say to me in that day, what? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name, what? Cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess in them, I never knew you. In other words, I don't see my character. I don't see my fruits of the Spirit in you. It says, depart from me, ye that work what? Iniquity. What's iniquity dealing with? Sin, transgression of God's law. So wait a minute, you're going to be saved in sin. Oh, oh, no, you're going to be saved. Jesus is going to save you, right? He's going to save you just to tell you to depart from me. Oh, yes. If God didn't change. If the plan of salvation can save men in sin, then we don't need a Savior. And why are we preaching? Why does God have to send a preacher? If the people are going to be saved in sin, you don't need a preacher. If nobody has to worry about anything. He didn't, need to send, he didn't need to send Jonah to Nineveh. He didn't need to send Paul to the Gentiles. People can be saved in sin. They don't need to be transformed. They can be saved in sin. Really? Really? Oh, man, what, what, what planet did you get that from? Because that's not the word of God. That's not the plan of salvation. The Bible makes it very plain. And then I will confess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work what? Iniquity, transgression of his law. It says here, apostate Christianity is called workers of iniquity, which is also called Babylon. But you know, that's not politically correct. They call the people in the other churches apostate. You know that, don't y'all? Let me go a little closer, though. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 10, and in Isaiah 24, 10, it says the city of confusion is broken down. Isaiah is talking about Babylon. He's called Babylon the city of confusion. And he says every house is shut up and no man can come in. Babylon is a city of confusion. What's another characteristic of the foolish? It says, in the mouth of the foolish, in Proverbs 14, 3, in the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise preserve knowledge. The foolish are what? Proud. You know any proud people in the end time? You know anybody that's got a, you know any proud people in the end time? Jesus knows them. He says in the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, he says, unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, Write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the, uh, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Huh? I know thy what? Works. That thou art neither what? Ho nor ha. Huh? And I count, and then he tells him, he says, I counsel thee to do what? Buy of me gold tried in the fire. For thou sayest in thy heart, I am rich and increase of goods and have need of nothing. I am rich. I am increased of goods. I have need of nothing. I know. I've been educated. I got my DG. I got my 
M- MDiv. I got my BA. I got I, I, I got my home and I got my good job. And I, 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 I am rich and increased with goods. I have need of nothing. Knowest thou not that thou art poor? What else, everybody? Wretched. What else? Miserable. What else? Blind. What else? And naked. You are lacking the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine such a thing? That's what the Bible says. But let's go a bit closer now. So we're going to find that when we deal with this issue, that we're dealing with the proud. But now the Bible said, while you are in that condition in Laodicea, you are a foolish virgin. Huh? I, the opposite of pride, is meekness. Didn't Jesus tell you in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30, he says what? Come unto me. All ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Now, how are you going to get rest? You say, just come to him. I'll come to him. I'm not getting no rest because you missed the last part. It says, take my yoke. Uh Uh-oh. I mean, you got to take off the yoke of the world. Take my yoke upon you. The yoke is dealing with the law because yoke was given to oxen so that they could carry it, so that they could be guided as they went down the road. Now, Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, the first thing, you got to take the yoke and do what, everybody? Learn of him. Meaning you got to sit down and let the Holy Ghost begin to instruct you in the word of God and in keeping his commandments. And he says, for I am what? Now, this is the catch. I am what? Meek. So if you become meek, you can't let I live anymore. When you become meek, some people take advantage of it. Some women think meekness is weakness. You're not acting fast enough. What's wrong with you? If you were a real man, you would have did something by now. And the brother's sitting there going, I'm going to handle it, honey. Yeah, you always say that, but you never get around to it. I'm going to take care of it. Yeah, when you're, when you're going to just get anxious. And you have to sit there and say, calm down. I'll deal with it in time. There you go with time, time, time. You know why time is, you know, most people think that a lot of people are always in a hurry. But you know, time is a friend. Time will reveal who people are in time. You don't have to sit there and try to guess what a person is. Just give it time. When you get in these relationships with these guys, you young people out here that don't want to obey the word of God, and you get caught up in these ungodly relationships with these forbidden, forbidden relationships that lead to forbidden engagements that later on to lead to forbidden marriages and then for forbidden, you wish you never got married. Just, if you really want to know, just give it time. Don't be anxious to jump into it. Just say, well, just give it some time. And if you start really getting into the Bible and he says, well, baby, when are we going to get together? He said, we're not going to get together until after we get married. Eh. We're not going to have no sex until we get married. Just give it some time. Well, you know, that's, that, that's not too cool, baby. You know, you know, I love you, but, you know, I can't. Well, you know, you, you just keep, you know, you, don't worry. If you love me, we'll be together soon enough. Just give it time. You can, the brothers can do it too, you know, but, uh, you know, so, hey, hey, you know, I would love, you know, baby, you know, I love you, but you know what? I got to wait. Just give it time. What's wrong? You gay? No, no, I'm not gay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what they say. Come on, I'm in, I, I, that's an old, okay? So I'm going to say, you go, well, you got another love out there somewhere? No, 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 just giving it time. Because what you don't want to do, you don't want to compromise yourself right away. You want to know who you're dealing with. You want to see the character of the person that's saying they want to spend their life with you or want to spend the night with you. Come on now. You're going to take it. You act like you don't know what I'm talking about. It'll come to you later. Some of you already have been in and wish you had never done it. Mm-hmm. Okay, it'll come to you later. Mm, I just say amen, walls. Okay, amen, blue carpet. Mm-hmm. Blue stands for the commandments, by the way, so, you know, that's good. You're all sitting on the commandments every day. You know that's God's favorite color, don't you? Because the commandments were a sapphire blue. Mm-hmm. And this is a pretty blue carpet and pretty blue on the... Oh, it comes to you. <laughs> okay. All right, let's get back to our study. You ready? The Bible goes on and says here, so we're going to say the foolish... Are, are the foolish, our workers of iniquity. But now let's talk about this third angel's message. Where is the third angel's message in the parable, okay? Where is the third angel's message in the parable, all right? I want you to find that. I want to find that for you so we can get to that point. As you see, I've got a lot of notes here, but I don't have time to cover everything. 
Usually I'd use these notes when I'm giving lectures at some of the schools and different colleges and stuff like that. But listen, go here. They said, let us have a look at the parable of the stony ground hearer. Now, remember, the, the stony ground hearer, if you read the book Christ Object Lessons, I believe I got it here. Let me just show this there. Ellen White gives you a hint of how you're going to find the third angel, how we're going to find the third angel's message in the parable. It says something about the foolish. The foolish virgins, okay, here we go. Listen carefully. Uh, this is what I want, okay. It says here in Christ's object lessons, page 411. It says here, I want to read this to you. It says the class represented by the foolish virgins are, are not hypocrites. It says they have regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. But they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. Uh-oh. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their own nature to be broken up. It goes on and says, this class is represented also by the stony ground hero. Don't miss this now. What are they represented by, everybody? Stony ground hero. Don't miss that, all right? When I was trying to figure out where the third angel's message was, and I was praying, and, and the Holy Spirit said, read this, and that's it. And the Holy Spirit said, go look up stony ground hero. You ever study your Bible, and you're searching something out, and the Holy Ghost tell you where to go? You ever do that? How do you feel when that happens? And then it'd be right on point with what you're thinking about. Or, or it gives more insight, and you just get all excited. You see, that, those are the signs when you're really having communion with God. And the angels of God are drawn near you. And the Holy Ghost is speaking to your mind. And your mind is really being turned back and forward and turning. The milk is turning. You're making butter. You're, you're making butter and you're going to get some honey after a while too called prophecy. As you're turning because you're going to have milk and butter. The Bible said, Jesus, no, you know, how do you get butter? You turn, you turn the milk into butter. How do you turn, what is milk? The sincere, what? Teachings of the word of God. So how do you turn the milk? Here's the milk. You're turning, you're turning. Like you're stirring, you're, you're turning, you're searching back and forth. As you turn the milk, it turns into butter. Huh? It'll come to you later. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you're just thinking I'm just crazy, right? Pastor Barry just off his rocker tonight. He must have had too much drink, too much too much, uh, too much uh, carrot juice today or something, right? Look carefully, though. It says here, this class is represented by the what, everybody? Stony ground here. Now, what do we know about the stony ground here? Let's go to Matthew chapter 13, and let's examine the stony ground here with me. Are you with me? Matthew chapter 13. We're going to examine what, everybody? The stony ground here. What, gr what here, everybody? Stony ground, all right? Now, you might be on some ground, but you don't want to be on stony ground. You believe me when I tell you, all right? Trust me, if you're stony ground tonight, you need to repent. You need to ask God to give you strength because you don't need to be no stony ground hero. Let's see what a stony ground hero is. Are you ready? Okay, now, let's look at the parable with me. Are you with me? Another parable. How do parables? He speaks in parables. Parables represent symbols. Parables are the exercise for you to prepare in basic Bible study to understand how to break down symbols so that by the time you get to Revelation and the book of Daniel, man, your mind is ready to break down symbolism. Boy, I tell you, you have a good time. Time, uh, anyway. I see, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. I told you I enjoy what I do. You, if there's something that makes you happy, it's the study of the word of God. My wife tell you the same thing. Sometimes she said, come and eat, I said, I'll be there. Two hours later, come and eat. I'll be there four hours later. Sometimes I forget that I have to go to eat. And by the time I'm finished, then I said, man, I need to eat. But it's 12 o'clock at night, and I can't eat. I have to go to bed. You ever study like that? You ever get that caught up in the Word of God? What I'm trying to get you to see is that if there's a lot of things in life you can get caught up with. Some of us are caught up with television. Some of us are caught up with sports. But I'm going to tell you something. When you really turn your eyes upon Jesus, you're going to get caught up in the Word of God. There's nothing that's going to, like Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word became unto me the joy and rejoice of my heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Like Job, you will say, like Job 23, 12, you said, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips, for I esteem the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. When you get into the word of God, you don't want to get out. How'd he come? Man, I tell you. Mm -mm -mm. Matthew 13, come on. In Matthew chapter 13, look at verse 5 with me. 
Now, this is a parable about a sower. Jesus is the sower. The seed is the word of God. Who's this? What's the seed? The word of God. If you don't believe that, go to Luke 8, 11 with me. Luke chapter 11, 8, 11, okay? I want you to see with me for just a moment. Okay, it says here, Matthew 13, 3, so you make sure you got it. It says, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Okay, a sower went forth to do what? Sow. All right, go to Luke 8, 11. Let's see, who does, let's see, what, let's see what it is. The sower is sowing the seed. Let's see what it is. Luke 8, 11. Everybody see that there? Luke chapter 8, verse 11. It says here, and it says, um, going on, it says here. Is that Luke 8? It's not Luke 8, 11 what I'm talking about? The seed is the what, everybody? There's the word of God. So Jesus is a sower, and he sows the word of God. Now, if you have a seed, what do you expect the seed to do? What is the law of a seed? Grow. But wait a minute. If I grow, if I throw, if I had apple seeds, and I went out in my yard, and I dug my hole the right way, and I began to plant apple seeds, what am I expecting? The apple seed. So the law of a seed is based on Genesis chapter 1. Look what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, the law of a seed, right quick, so you get the point, all right? The law of a seed, the Bible says here in Genesis chapter 1, it says here, the law of the seed here, it says, God calls it dry land, okay, I see it. It says here, let, verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree after yielding fruit after his what? The law of the seed is that it produced after his, so Jesus is the sower, his seed is the word of God. The word of God is to reproduce Jesus in you. And at the end of the world, he's supposed to see a harvest of human beings that's been transformed by the renewing of their mind through the seed, which was the word of God. Remember Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's a seed in you. Hmm? Did you study this morning? Did you claim a promise? Did you read anything this morning dealing with the word of God? Did you put any seed? Did you put a little drop? Did you put a half a seed? Did you put a beet seed in you today? You know why I said a beet seed, right? One day I was planting in the garden, and I thought, I thought, you know, my, my, my I was, I was, we were in our class dealing with gardening, and I, I knew about gardening because my mother had had me planting gardens and corn, but I hadn't planted beets. So I decided that I looked at the beet seeds. You ever seen beet seeds? How many have seen beet seeds? Beet seeds are so tiny. I looked at the beet seed, I said, man, this seed needs some help. I just can't put one seed here. I need to put about maybe three or four or five of them seeds there, right? Now, with beet seeds, you don't do that. You just plant that one seed there. And so I, I, I saw the seed was so tiny, and I'm thinking it's not going to grow. The beet seed is that small. That small. If I put tight by like that, smaller than that. And I dropped it in the hole. I dug my, I cleared out everything. I dug the hole for it, and I put the beet seed in there. And I decided that, man, that's just one little seed. Let me put some more. I put five more in there. Little did I know that when the beet seed finally grew, it grew several beets in that one little area, and it should have only grew one and had them spaced out a little bit. I didn't realize what the beet seed would do. But it produced beets, but it produced abundance of beets, but too close together. I ask you, did God, did you let God put a seed in you? It can be as tiny as a beet seed, but it will germinate if it gets the water and the sunshine. Are you with me now? Rain. And if it's cultivated and don't let the weeds choke it out, things of this world, it will grow. And watch out for the deer. They'll come and eat your, eat, your, eat your beets and eat the green leaves off of them. Watch carefully. But the seed supposed to produce after is what? Kind. That's the issue. All right, go with me. Matthew 13 again. Are you there? Matthew 13. Are you there? All right. Now, let's take a look. The Bible also says here, now let's go, let's look at this carefully for a moment. It goes on and says this about it. 
it says, and some, it says here, and when he had sold, some, verse 4, Matthew 13, 4, and when he had sold, some fell where? Some fell on the wayside. Okay, now watch this. It says here, some fell upon, it says, some fell by the wayside. It says here, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Verse 5, not, not Mark, verse 5. We're talking about stony ground here. What, who are we talking about, everybody? Stony ground here. Verse 5 says, and some fell upon stony places, where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprang up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Hmm. How would you like to, how would you like to have sown a seed and prepared for it, and all of a sudden, when the sun came up, it withered away because it had no root. Hmm. What is the master trying to say to us? Going on, deepness of earth is the word bathos. Same word we used in our beginning of when we did our opening. This word deepness is the word bathos. It means profundity. It means no, no depth of understanding of the word of God. The seed was the word of God. But if the seed is being planted in hearts, and some people are, got, got the word, but it's not taking root. They are on the surface with it. They, they, they come to church, but they have the form of godliness, but they deny the power. They deny the power of rain. You see, the Holy Ghost is represented by water. And some of us are coming to church and we are dry as the hills of Gaboa. We're lacking moisture. There's no rain. There's not a drop or even a sprinkle in some of us. We're just as dry and cold and lifeless as though we have never known Jesus. Now something's wrong with this picture. We're going to find out what happened. You had a good seed soul. You did experience the gospel, but somewhere along the line, you didn't get moisture. Somewhere along the line, you lost your connection. Somewhere along the line, your pipeline, your water pipeline, your sprinkler system somehow shut off. We need to find out what's happening here. Listen carefully. It goes on. Now, they had no deep reserve. Now, why is this important? Because this parable is connected to Matthew 25. And as uh, Spirit of Prophecy said that the stony ground hearers had the stony ground hearers is represented by the foolish virgins. They lack something. Look very carefully. And last, let me go one more step with this on this so you get this. Now, I want to know something. The Bible says here that they lack no deepness of earth. Now I want you to go to Luke with me for a moment. And I want you to see what Luke wanna say about the same thing. Luke 8, 6. What book did I say, everybody? Luke chapter 8, verse 6. Are you with me now? And Luke chapter 8. Verse 6, listen again what the Bible says. In Luke 8, 6, the Bible says here, And some fell upon the rock, and as soon as it was sprang up, it withered away. Now we get the picture. What happened? Some fell upon what? A rock. And as soon as it what? Sprung up, it withered. Now why did it wither away? Because it fell upon a rock, and it didn't get any soil. Are you with me now? And it sprung up and it withered away because it lacked, what everybody? It lacked moisture. What's another word for moisture? Water. Hmm. Lack water. Okay. Lack water. Lack moisture. What do you mean lack water, lack moisture? Going on, be closer. Let me get a little closer with you on this. It, the word moisture is the word hakimus, and it means dampness. It means to diffuse wetness. It means it can be felt as a vapor in the atmosphere, a condensed liquid or surface or object or dampness. It lacked moisture. It had no water. What does water represent? Turn me to John 7, 37 and 38. John 7, 37 and 38. I want to know this, 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 this stony ground here, they lack what? Moisture. Look carefully, John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. It says, in the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believed for me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow what, everybody? Living waters. Living water. But 
this spake he of the what, everybody? But this spake he of the what? Of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus had not yet been what? Glorified. So wait a minute. Tell me, according to the parable, now we're looking at a parable. The parable said they lacked moisture. What did they lack? The Holy Spirit. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But isn't God's church promised rain before this, before this thing ends? Aren't we promised early and latter rain? Why are we coming down to the end of time in a parable that's taking us into the issue of the Advent movement and the repeat of our history very soon? Why are God's people coming down to the time and they're lacking moisture? They're dry. They're, they're, something's wrong here. Something's deadly wrong. Let's go a bit closer, though. We find out they're lacking what? Moisture. Now, moisture represents the Holy Spirit. But what is the, look here. But what is the warning, uh, mo what is the warning that God gives? Now, he said they're lacking moisture. You know, moisture deals with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's dealing with moisture. So wait a minute, I got to think it through. Let's go through it for a moment. Go with me to, what is moisture? What is this moisture that he's talking about? Holy Ghost. So let's take a look. What about the Holy Ghost? What do we know about the Holy Ghost? Go with me to, uh, let's talk about character first. Uh, go with me to Galatians 5.22. In Galatians 5.22, the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust thereof. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. The Bible says that they're lacking the fruits of the Spirit here. Mm, you got fruit? I didn't ask you if you have talent. I didn't ask you if you have education. I didn't ask you how many 52 Sabbaths you come to church. I asked you, do you have fruit? You got fruit? Look very carefully. The Bible goes on and says now, but now watch this now. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Let's go closer to Galatians. Go with me to Ephesians 5, 9. To Ephesians 5, 9. The Bible tells about the fruits of the Spirit right quick. But the fruit of the Spirit is all what? Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Wait a minute. You're lacking fruit. You're lacking what? Goodness. You're lacking a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, you're lacking righteousness. Whose righteousness are you lacking? Now, why would you say that you lack, because I'm lacking truth, I'm lacking righteousness? Because the Bible says we find out something about truth. Remember? Thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness. Psalms 119, 142, and thy law is truth. Truth and righteousness are synonymous with each other. So when you say righteousness, you're also talking about truth. But whose righteousness are they lacking? The Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Let's see what they're lacking. Come on. Philippians 3, verse 9. I want to know. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, the Bible says here, and it says, And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Uh-oh. What they're lacking? Righteousness by faith. But wait a minute, is righteousness, is, is, is righteousness by faith connected to water? Let's see for a moment. Let's see if, if righteousness by faith is connected to water. And let's see if that's connected to the Holy Ghost. Come on, let's see. You ready? You sure? Because I don't want you to go to sleep. I know some of you are tired, so I'm, I don't, don't worry. I understand. If you do sleep, I'm not going to penalize you, all right? Because I've been there too. I've been in meetings where I've been tired. And some preacher got there. Wake him up. Now I'm not going to tell you that. I know some of you work hard, but just bear with me. Hold on. Hold on, brother. All right? Hold on, sister. It's going to be okay. But anyway, I understand. All right? Is that okay? Yeah, we shouldn't sleep in church, but I'm the, I understand it. How you, can, can we be real about this thing or not? What? I'm going to be real, I'm gonna be real with y'all, okay? If you're tired, you're tired. Amen? All right. It's not like you come here every week like that. If you come here every week now, and then I got to talk to flee and say, hey, bro, what's wrong? come to you later okay all right but let's go here all right now okay let's see they're lacking what what righteousness now whose righteousness are we talking about the righteous which is of God by faith but now I want to know is righteous connected to water or something like that 
Go with me to Matthew 5, 6. Come on, let's go there first. Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Are you there? Come on. Matthew 5, 6. Matthew 5, 6, you know these are the Beatitudes. And these are power, this, this is a powerful study all by itself. But let's go. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are they which do what? Hunger and thirst. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, don't miss that. Thirst. After what? Righteousness. So if you're lacking water, you must be very thirsty. Okay? All right. Now, listen carefully. Now, now that we know that, I want to know something. Is the Holy Ghost connected to water? We just said it over in John 7, 37. Is that right? But let's go a little bit closer, doll, and let's see again. Go with me, because how were the scriptures written? Who wrote the scriptures? 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the what? Will of man, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the what? Holy Ghost. So these holy men were known as prophets, and the Holy Ghost spoke through the prophets. Is that right? So now I want to know something. Now that we know the Holy Ghost spoke through the prophets, I want to find out one other thing. I want to know what did the prophet, what, did script, what are the scriptures profitable for? Don't miss this. 2 Timothy 3.16. You know this text. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, the word profitable means useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Righteousness. The scriptures give instruction in what? Righteousness. Not unrighteousness, not sin. Look carefully now. We're going to be closer. So if that's the case, the, the scriptures are also profitable for what? Doctrine. But the doctrine that the script, the major, one of the major doctrines that the scripture will give will be instructions in what? Righteousness. Now wait a minute. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32. I want to know, again, about is the, is the Holy Ghost connected to rain? Watch very carefully. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And when you get there, just say amen. Are you there? Come on, I'm moving fast with you. But I got, sorry about that, but I want to get you out. But I've got to give you, give you this right quick. Watch carefully. Deuteronomy 32. Are you there? Whenever I don't finish up here, now I finish up at Sabbath school, okay? Let me make sure you get here. All right? It says, give your old heavens... And I go give you, O ye heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew. It says, as the dew, up, as, it says here, it says, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Wait a minute. Let's break that down again. My doctrine shall drop as the so reverse it. Rain drops as doctrine. What are you supposed to pray for? You praying for the latter rain? So how you know you got the latter rain? What's the evidence that you, the, the rain coming your way? You up here? Let's pray. You got. We have these projects. Let's let's have latter rain project 2000 and 2019. And you get in, you come here and pray, Lord, please grant us rain. We want to get rain. And you know, all so you don't know what the rain is. You wait on a feeling. Oh, you, want, you want some impoggerance to come over you. You want some, 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 some to get up in you so you say, hallelujah. That, that is not the evidence that the Holy Ghost is with you as many times. You might feel good today. You can feel good, but feel good does not mean by principle that necessary that that is the Holy Ghost. But the Bible said, my doctrine shall drop as rain. My speech shall distill as a dew. Rain comes as doctrine. But wait a minute. Who brings this rain? I want to know some. Who brings this rain? Go with me to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. Are you there? Should be there by now. I'm turning slow so you can get there. Are you there now? All right. Hosea. All right. Let's go. In Hosea chapter 10, I want to show you something right quick. I want to know. Watch, you ready? All right, let's see something for a moment. Hosea chapter 10, look in here at verse 12. It says, sow to yourselves in what, everybody? Righteousness. Your says, a reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground. Talking about this, your heart. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain, what everybody, righteousness on you. So righteousness of God, the righteousness met the message of righteousness by faith will come to the Adventist people as rain. 
but it will come in doctrine. Now, if you don't believe that, then let's take a look. Let's take a little. Let's go. Well, let's walk back through memory lane for a moment. Uh, in 1888, two men, two young men named Jones and Wagner, came with a doctrine that Ellen White endorsed and later said it was the message of the latter rain coming to Seventh-day Adventism in 1888 and had the church received that message given by Jones and Wagner, we could have been in the kingdom. None of us would have been born. In 1890 she wrote it, that Christ could have come. But we rejected the message, and as a result, we've been wandering in the wilderness, and now we're coming down to that final stretch with the image of the beast now being formed before probation closed, and God is telling us that it's time for you to seek me and get rain. But rain comes as doctrine, and you won't study. You won't bring your life into conformity. Somehow you think God is going to accept you as you are. You come as you are to Jesus, but you are never the same after you come. Because you're dealing with transformation of mind, of will, and, and, of, and of likes and dislikes. You're being transformed. Your life is being changed. You're getting ready for a heavenly kingdom of new Jerusalem. Holy people are going to be there around holy angels, miserable people, unhappy people, people who don't like to live for God will not be there. you got to get ready. We're going home one of these days. Don't you know the dead got to come out the grave? Don't you know God got to reverse this thing and set all things back in order? We're not living a fairy tale. This is not Alice in Wonderland. This is not the, 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 the story of beauty and the beast. We're dealing with the real issue of a dilemma called sin and brought death upon this planet. And we got a Savior who loves us so much that he's decided to redeem us. I want to go home. I want to I experience righteousness by faith now. Daily. That's the only power I got is power of Christ's righteousness. There's no other power that can keep me from sin. There's no other power that can empower me to resist sin. There's nothing in me. I cannot do it in my own strength. I cannot stop sin. I love sin. Sin loves my fallen nature. And only when I'm transformed in the mind can I have the power to resist sin. Only by them doing of the Holy Spirit. And only as I submit to God when that temptation comes. If you can stop temptation, you can stop sin. How you figure you can't, how you, listen. Sin is always thought out before you do it. You remember, yeah, my parents not going to be home. I'll be over there around 12 o'clock. Uh -huh. You remember those days, some of you? You remember them plans? My mama gonna be gone. She's a gone. I'm gonna call Charles. I'll call him at 10 30 and tell him to be here by 11. Daddy be gone. Mama be gone. We can have at least two hours together. Sin is always planned out. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. All right? But at the same time, sometimes it's planned out, and then sometimes your parents come home early and it's not carried out. Well, you know, I don't feel too good. I came home early. Mama, okay, all right. I got to call him right away. I'm going to come over here. My mama home. Y'all remember that? I don't know how y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all sit there like we don't, we don't know what sin is. So we, we, we play games with ourselves. Look here. But anyway, but the Bible says what? What did it say? What did it say? Ephraim is a what? I'm talking about Ephraim. Sow yourself righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he what? Rain what, everybody? Righteousness upon you. So righteousness comes as rain, and the rain it comes as doctrine. So wait a minute. What are they lacking? Fruits of the Spirit and sound doctrine in the church. what the Bible says. Don't miss it. Now, let's go back. Matthew 13. Come on. Got to get you up. Got to get, get close this and we'll pick up the rest tomorrow morning, okay? All right? Because get, I'm going to get you a closure on this point. All right? All right? You ready? Are you sure? Okay, I can let you go. Come on. 
Ah, okay. God has been good to us. We, we thank God for the Sabbath. Amen. Look what the Bible says here. The Bible says back in Matthew 13, it said they had no deepness of what? Earth. And go with me to, okay, now, they, Luke said they lacked what? Moisture. That means they lack what? Rain. They lacked a connection with God. They lacked the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They had the form of godliness, but denied the power. What's the power? Acts 1.8. Well, you should receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And you should be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, earth. So we want to find that here, look closer. Remember, this is noted, note, note, I want you to notice something. In the, days of, and in the days of Elijah, when there was no rain for three years, Israel was lacking what? Moisture, rain. All right? And we'll talk about that one tomorrow morning. I'll get more into it. But where, I want to just give you this next point right quick on this. Now, the Bible says something. And we're going we're gonna to pick up more on this tomorrow, so get ready. We're going to close you on a good note here. And that's in the parable. In Matthew 13... What did the Bible say happened? They lacked rain, and what happened? And when the sun was up, they were scorched. Is that what the Bible said? Hmm. Go with me to Matthew 13, and let's see verse 20. Let's see what Jesus gives as explanation. We're going to put it together as we close. Ready? Pick up the rest of my morning Sabbath school. But he that receiveth the seed in stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and are not with joy receive it. And this is some of our church members. You first came to Jesus, you received the word, you were happy. So I found it. I told your friends all about it. And with joy receive it, yet hath not what? Yet hath not root in himself, but dure for a while. For a while means you're in the church for 30 years. You're an officer. For a while, you endure. You receive it with joy. But for when tribulation and persecution come, arises, persecution arise because of the word, by and by, he is offended. Wait a minute. You've been in church for how long? For a while. For years. And he's been this faithful man, faithful woman. Appeared to be that way anyway. He looked like wheat in the church. Not like a tear. He looked like a wheat. But when the trials and tribulation come from the church because of the preached word. Now the preached word got something to do with the people being scorched. So wait a minute. What is it? What is it that's causing the people to, what is this causing this person that's been in church all these years, been a faithful preacher, faithful elder, faithful officer, whatever, and what is it that's causing him to get offended? The Bible says, it's the Bible says, and verse 6, going back to Matthew 13, 6, when the sun was up. And then it says, when the sun was up, and then the parable goes over and says, and the explanation, it says, but when the sun came up, it brought heat. They were scorched, but the heat represented persecution. It had something to do with persecution when the sun was up. Well, when does the sun come up? Go with me to Matthew, go with me, go with me in your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 16. I'm going to close you on this note, and we'll pick up the rest of the morning. So you can have something to think about. Amen. Matthew, Mark, Luke. You ready? Now listen very carefully. You, some, some of you know this text, some of you don't. Some of you know it, but you know it, in the wrong, you know it in another light. Listen carefully. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. I didn't hit you yet. Matthew 16, 2. Mark 16, Mark 16, 2. I'm going to read it one more time for you. And very early in the morning, I'm talking about when, remember the parable said when the sun comes up. 
The parable is dealing with the third angel's message. And it's dealing with the stony ground hearers. What does the third angel's message say? If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark and his sword in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. What is the mark of the beast? It is Sunday observance. And here in the parable, Jesus is telling you that the people in the church will get offended when the third angel's message is preached and the sun is rising. And the sun comes up on the first day of the week. And Sunday is on the first day of the week. When Sunday shall be exalted, many in our church will be offended when we start preaching against Sunday. When the sun comes up. Oh, I want you to go home now. Go home and think about it. Because the sun coming up is also the abomination of desolation. And we'll talk about it tomorrow morning at Sabbath school. How many plan to be here? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. Please help us get ready because the sun is coming up. But let us not be offended like in the parable. But let us be active, brothers and sisters. Let us have love one for another. Let us be willing to lay down our lives for one another. But let us stand for the truth and bring souls to Christ and be filled with the Holy Ghost with early and latter rain, this prayer to the sun coming up. Lord, please help us. The sun is rising. Please help us. And save us, Father. And we thank you for your Holy Sabbath. And we thank you for this Friday night meeting. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And I'll see you tomorrow morning when the sun shall come up.